welcome once again into the Radiopedia Reading Room, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tassiography or palmistry. This is a radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me, Ab sailing down for a quick chat before he rides off on his motorbike looking for a place to skydive. It's my co-host Frank Gaylard. <laughs> Hello, and I genuinely have no idea what you're talking about. Ah, good. I was hoping. <laughs> so you didn't watch the Paris Olympics closing ceremony no. this morning? Uh, no. I was, I was actually likening you to, to Tom Cruise. He made an appearance. Oh, did he do a stunt or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he jumped off the side of the stadium. So he rappels down, <laughs> goes amongst the athletes. Some of them, yeah, taking selfies with the athletes. One of them jumped up and kissed him. <laughs> and he took the Olympic flag and, you know, he's riding off to the LA 2028 Olympics. Uh, so he got on his motorbike. Then it's probably pre-recorded, but he rides that off into a. It's definitely pre-recorded. Rides that into a, an airplane and then jumps out of the airplane down to LA and then uh, fantastic classic Tom Cruise stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, this will be uh, of great surprise to you and our listeners. But I managed to go uh, well up to about two weeks ago, not knowing that the Olympics were coming or where they were going to be. <laughs> I made it to day two before I knew that they were on. And until right now, I, I didn't know that it had actually finished. Um, but I'll have to check out Tom. Yeah. He's actually a constant source of jokes in my family because my mother despises him. She <laughs> despises him in a way that is completely unjustified by anything he has done. It's not like she's anti-Scientologist specifically. She just keeps saying that he's slimy and he's wolfish, whatever that means. Yeah. And so we're constantly taunting her about it. Whereas I'm, um, I vacillate when it comes to Tom. Sort of. I thought you were going to say something else. I vacillate when I think of Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, he's clearly bonkers, right? But yeah, yeah. he seems to go through life doing just exactly whatever he wants. And he's definitely not an NPC. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, you know that, um, I don't know if it's a conspiracy theory as such, but that idea that we're all living in a simulation and we're all non-player characters. Right, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that the simulation has been created to allow players to live out sort of their fantasies. And people like Tom Cruise and Elon Musk and Trump and Tay-Tay, uh, they're the players. Yeah, we're they're just the, the backdrop players. for them. Uh, so so like Snoop Dogg would definitely be a player. Oh, then. absolutely. He was, he was the real hero of the Olympics. You probably didn't catch that. Uh, no. What did he do? <laughs> I mean, he's just a good sport. He was like turning up to heaps of events, supporting athletes, you know, taking selfies, signing autographs. And there was also this um, scarce kind of Snoop Dogg pin that people were collecting, and it was him him blowing like a puff of smoke, making the Olympic <laughs> rings. <laughs> and, and it was like really, really rare that people would get this pin, so it was like became this whole collectible thing. With the I'll, I'll find, uh, find the image for you. Hold on, let me pause the video. Here you go. Here's the image. Have a look at that. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Snoop Dogg is such a champion. I love the fact that he has lent into the idea of using his name to promote whatever. And yeah. he does it so wholeheartedly that he yeah, comes yeah. out the other end of it and it's cool, like Pop-Tarts and insurance and lotto and it doesn't matter. He'll put his name to literally anything yeah. and he's just so just awesome. Just genuine, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. So he was he was definitely and he's also he also performed in the closing ceremony as right. well. I'll have to so, check that yeah. out. Yeah, pretty good. I do like a bit of Snoop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is our first episode back after the conference gala. So it was a, a massive event, uh, almost 14,000 delegates in the end, which was uh, just amazing. Yeah, it was incredible. And particularly because the majority of those delegates were from low and middle income region who were getting access for free and who don't have that many other options for that sort of thing. And mm. I think it's really hard for us to understand and for everyone who contributes to Radiopedia to understand the impact that our site and specifically the conference is having, particularly when you think of how, not just at the time, but in the months and the years to come, the knowledge that these thousands of people have gained through the conference then gets applied not just to their patients, but to the teaching that they do locally. Yeah. Um, the whole team did an amazing job, as always. Couldn't be prouder of what we've achieved. You get that vibe in the chat, right, during Absolutely. the actual live. I mean, the majority of people watch on demand, but I think a lot of people just 
drop by during the week into the live sessions and and drop into the chat and the amount of appreciation in the chat and just seeing where everybody was from like that global audience yeah, right? i love that it's it's inspiring for us as educators right you can track the time zone by yes. who's saying hello at different times some uh, people saying good morning just having my coffee and we're like good night just having a negroni <laughs> yeah and there were a few people who were clearly trying to watch it all live they were there every session and it's like right. i haven't had any sleep and it's like you can have sleep we gave out the awards in the last in the live episode during the conference but there, yeah there should be an award for those people who yeah. visit the chat the most because there were some people who were amazing one of the reasons is it actually turns out is that some colleges don't recognize on demand for CME. Mm. So we got a few requests from Qatar, I think, where you know we, they, the certificates needed to have the word live on it or the points wouldn't count. And so I mm. guess those people uh, are going to be staying up to watch the live sessions. Uh, and you have some big post-conference news to share, Gaylord. You're finally being forced to step down. <laughs> Force is probably the wrong word, but oh, I know, I know, mate. I'm just, I'm, I'm referencing Biden. Here. Oh, another Biden reference. Ah, yes. <laughs> well, after 19 years of doing this, I've decided to step down as editor in chief. Um, mm-hmm. Not step down from Radiopedia, but just as editor in chief, and I'm replaced by Henry Knipe, who I guess in this analogy is Kamala. <laughs> yeah. And Henry has, in fairness, been doing the job for years anyway so i don't think there'll be much of a change but um it's actually really good to have that feeling of i should have made it to 20 but one more year i just didn't have it in me 20 is a long a long long time time. to be the editor-in-chief uh no yeah henry is an amazing person and uh i'm sure he's gonna lead and guide the editorial team fantastically well so the future is definitely in good hands but you won't be stepping down from the podcast though no And that's, you know, everyone knows that's the more important thing. Um, But we are going to be moving to monthly rather Mm -hmm. than weekly episodes, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, just to see if we can get the right balance between all of the the things that we do. Yeah, I think monthly is probably right and certainly better than stopping. And we've talked about this a lot off air, but the podcast is an interesting sort of problem child because we like doing it. But it's more work, so much more work than it appears from the outside. And there's definitely an opportunity cost there for what we could be doing with that time instead. Mm. So, yes, finding the right mix of content and frequency, I think, is really important. And uh, when we started off, we started off weekly, and that was crazy. I don't know why we did that. In retrospect, the idea of doing a weekly podcast was bonkers. (laughs) And then we dropped a fortnightly, and that's still pretty busy, particularly if we need to record the main segment as well. We can Mm. can just turn up and and do this around a segment. It's much easier. But if we have to do an interview or something, it takes ages. So hopefully monthly works better. I'd miss not doing it, so I'm hoping this this is a good way forward. Yeah, and I think we'll we'll mainly focus on uh, taking some of the panels from the conference yeah. And using those as the main segment um, rather than recording a lot of, of new main segment content. But we'll see how we go. I think monthly is going to be right. Fingers and crossed. the conference panels that I was involved with or uh, produced or listened to, a lot of them were really good and deserve to be seen yeah. more than just through the conference. Absolutely. I think so. I think they get many more listens as a podcast than they do during the conference just because people are kind of biased towards watching lectures and workshops during the on-demand phase rather than re-watching panels. Anyway, we should get to today's episode, Gaylord. So this is a solo readful from you. Mm -hmm. So you'll be reading the Radiopedia article on focal cortical dysplasia. Uh, So this is something uh, we look for as radiologists as a cause of epilepsy. And this is beautifully timed, Gaylord, because today you're releasing the third installment in your Brain Tumor Learning Pathway series, and it's all about epileptogenic brain tumors. Yes, the third installment of my magnus opus. <laughs> this is the, uh, it shouldn't take more than six months to do project. That's now about three, three and a half years in, and I'm not yet halfway done. But <laughs> still, I think these are pretty worthwhile. I enjoy making them. And my hope is that when the whole set is finished, they will sort of be the go-to course for this entire topic. And importantly... And and if not, someone could do a short summary version of it for us. If not, that's right. (laughs) 
<laughs> Importantly, they do build on each other, so they're not really standalone, and they go off on many, many tangents. No, that are not too much sure related. Not. <laughs> and so, actually, by going through them, you're not only getting brain tumor. Uh, but you fold in lots of other things that I think are important that wouldn't necessarily have their own place. Yeah, like Tom Cruise and his wolfish looks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a discount for the course this month, Gaylord, so people should go ahead and take advantage of that and we'll drop a link in the show notes. And, of course, it's free for Radiopedia All Access Pass holders and those in all of our free access countries. Uh, should we get... Uh, into the main segment, Gaylord. How about I hit play now on your recording? We'll listen to you exploring focal cortical dysplasia, and then we'll be back for another chat in the outro. Let's do it. Today, I wanted to take you on what I'm going to call a link surf. We're going to start with an article. Today, it's going to be focal cortical dysplasia. And as I read it and go off on some tangents, I'm sure, I'll also follow the occasional link to other articles that expand on a particular topic or just seem interesting at the time. So let's get cracking. Focal cortical dysplasias represent a heterogeneous group of disorders of cortical formation, which may demonstrate both architectural and proliferative features. They are one of the most common causes of epilepsy, and can be associated with hippocampal sclerosis and cortical glioneuronal neoplasms. Well, there's not much to add to that introduction other than cortical cortical dysplasias are fairly common if you have an epilepsy service and come into play in a variety of clinical and imaging contexts. So understanding what they are and how they're classified is actually really relevant to everyday practice. Okay, so up next is epidemiology. The age of presentation, usually with epilepsy, in part depends on the type of cortical dysplasia, with type 1, and it says C below for the classification, more frequently presenting in adulthood. The clinical presentation of focal cortical dysplasia is a frequent cause of drug refractory epilepsy. And this is important because the vast majority of cases, the history will be one of long-standing epilepsy. Obviously, Sometimes you will find it after a first seizure, but this is less common. And if you find something that you think might be a focal cortical dysplasia, particularly if it is on the bigger side, in someone who's only had a recent onset of seizures, be wary of making that call because it might actually represent a tumour instead. But we will eventually come to that as well. Okay, on to pathology. And we'll begin with classification. Since the first description in 1971 by Taylor et al., a number of classification systems for focal cortical dysplasia have been devised. This includes a previously commonly used classification based on histopathology proposed by Palmini et al. in 2004 and a genetic or imaging classification proposed by Barkovich in 2005. The consensus classification published by the International League Against Epilepsy's Diagnostic Methods Commission, lead author Bloomke, was incorporated, mo, sorry, has incorporated and largely superseded other classification systems. Is it just me or the International League Against Epilepsy sounds like a superhero ensemble? In any case, most people seem to refer to this as the Bloomke classification, which I'm guessing must irk the dozens of other co-authors on those two uh, papers. One was published, I think, in 2011, and then a, a subsequent revision in 2022. And each one have, you know, 20 co-authors. But Blumke is the first author of both of those. Anyway, moving along. Unfortunately, as is the case with many classification systems that have developed in parallel with numerous iterations and revisions, there is significant overlap between the various classification systems with the same terminology used slightly differently. As such, it is safest to explicitly state which classification system is being used, for example, Bloomke Type 2b. This is a really important point and one which I think we often overlook just saying Type 1 or whatever. Uh, And it can be pretty ambiguous, not just in this context, but in many other conditions that have multiple classification systems. 
It's annoying, especially with voice recognition, to add the classification system because often the spelling is difficult and you might not actually remember how to spell Bloomkey. But I think it is actually really essential. And maybe that can be made easier by including these in your reporting templates. I certainly do for some of the more commonly used ones. Anyway, the article then links to individual articles for Taylor dysplasia, Palmini classification, Barkovich classification, and the ILAE or Bloomkey classification. This is going to be our first link surf because I think understanding the Bloomkey classification or ILAE is important and honestly not that difficult. So here we go. Blumke et al. proposed a widely adopted International League Against Epilepsy Consensus classification system for focal cortical dysplasia in 2011, which shares many features with the previously described classification systems by Palmini and Barkovich. In 2022, an updated proposed consensus classification for focal cortical dysplasia which builds upon the existing 2011 classification, was published. This updated classification added the following pathological classifications. Mild malformation of cortical development, mild malformation of cortical development with oligodendric lyle hyperplasia, or MOGI, and no definite fo focal cortical dysplasia on histopathology. I want to come back to a couple of these later on, but for now, let's just keep going. This classification also introduced a novel multi-layered classification scheme combining histopathological diagnosis, genetic and neuroimaging findings to provide an integrated final diagnosis. And this is in line with what's been happening in many other areas, for example, the WHO classification, which had traditionally been purely histological and now incorporates uh, many other components, mostly driven by genetic or molecular markers, but also, fortunately, recognizing the importance of imaging in some of these classifications. Okay, so the 22 Bloomkey ILAE classification is, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little to make it easier to listen to, it divides it into three main types, which were also in the earlier classifications. Type 1, focal cortical dysplasia with abnormal cortical lamination. And type 1 is divided into three subtypes, A, B, and C. A is with abundant microcolumns, previously known as radial cortical lamination. Type B is abnormal layering, so that's horizontal rather than vertical. And type C is both vertical and horizontal abnormalities, radial and tangential cortical lamination. And type 1 you don't see it very much, so you don't need to worry so much about it, but I'm sure we'll come to that in the radiographic features section. The next one is the most important one because this is the one we see and recognize most commonly. Type 2 focal cortical dysplasia with dysmorphic neurons, also known as Taylor dysplasia, which comes in two flavors, type A without balloon cells and type B with balloon cells. And we'll discuss the MRI appearances of these soon as well. Next is type 3, where focal cortical dysplasia is not the most notable abnormality, but rather is associated with some other lesion, which usually is the thing that we will, on imaging, focus on. And so type 3 is cortical dyslamination associated with A, hippocampal sclerosis, B, adjacent to a brain tumor, glial or glioneuronal tumors, C, adjacent to a vascular malformation, and D, adjacent to other lesions acquired in early life, such as stroke. The next section added in 2022 adds a couple of entities that don't fulfill criteria for type 1, 2, and 3, and involve the subcortical white matter. They are mild malformations of cortical development with excessive heterotopic neurons, and mild malformations of cortical development with oligodendroglial hyperplasia, known as MOGHE, M-O-G-H-E. And lastly, no definite focal cortical dysplasia on histology. Before going back to the focal cortical dysplasia article, I want to take a bit of a further detour and follow the link to mild malformations of cortical development, generally, and then look at mild malformations of cortical development with oligodendroglial hyperplasia, or MOGHE, specifically, because it's fairly interesting. So, reading from mild malformations of cortical development, 
previously known as microdysgenesis, corresponds to microscopic malformations of cortical development with heterotopic neurons and an abnormal cortical architecture. Mild malformations of cortical development are one cause of drug-resistant partial epilepsy. However, it has also described in autopsy studies of asymptomatic patients. And this last bit I find intriguing, and I can't help but going off on a little tangent here, because sometimes, and this is often, probably more often than I care to admit, I've wondered about the incidence of tumors that occur in specific parts of the brain. And I haven't yet come up with a satisfactory answer. And this most commonly occurs when people talk about the temporal lobes as the most common location, particularly for a bunch of tumors that frequently present with long-term epilepsy, the so-called LEAT tumors, long-term epilepsy-associated tumors. And this group, it's not a pathological entity as such, but just a convenient grouping, includes dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumors or DNETs and ganglioglomas and gangliocytomas and and variably includes other tumors in there. But most of them are really indolent. And so perhaps they're indolent enough to never cause a problem from mass effect and therefore become a problem when they cause seizures. And seizures are much more likely to occur in the temporal lobe. And so I keep wondering how many people have small DNETs that are in non-eloquent parts of the brain and aren't as likely to cause epilepsy and that we never find out about them. I suspect we'd know because we do a lot of scans for lots of other reasons, but I still wonder. I still wonder whether these statements that these tumours occur most commonly in the temporal lobes really should be these tumours when diagnosed are most often found in the temporal lobes, which is maybe a subtle, boring difference, but nonetheless important at some level. Anyway, going back to mild malformations of cortical development. Mild malformations of cortical development correspond to microscopic changes that constitute cortical laminar disorganization, abnormal cortical myelinated fibers, neuronal clustering, and heterotopic or excessively numerous neurons in the white matter, subcortical areas, or cortical layers. One. It's important to emphasize that isolated single neurons are encountered in the white matter of normal brains. On the other hand, a large group of malpositioned cortical neurons in the white matter are found in types of malformations of cortical development associated with epilepsy, such as focal cortical dysplasia type 1, 2, and 3. Mild malformations of cortical development may therefore lie between these two extremities, but the point at which white matter neuronal numbers become abnormal and represent a significant malformation is controversial and not well defined. The fact that several types of cortical dysplasia may be observed in the same patient illustrates the complexity of this broad spectrum of pathological processes that affect cortical mantle formation. Okay, so this is one of those awkward teenage conditions. It's a bit in between better defined entities. And when this is the case, you almost invariably find really significant inter-observer variability. But that doesn't mean that it isn't interesting. And if you remind yourself that many of the diagnoses we talk about aren't really clearly demarcated real things, but are rather an area of a spectrum with arbitrary lines that define one from another, and that these lines are likely to change over time, it, it kind of reconciles you to this heterogeneity. Now, one of these mild malformations of cortical development that I've seen recently was a case of mild malformations of cortical development with oligodendroglial hyperplasia, or MOGI. So let's go off on this tangent here. Mild malformations of cortical development with oligodendroglial hyperplasia and epilepsy is a histopathological entity primarily associated with drug-resistant frontal lobe epilepsy. Mogi is characterized by a distinct histological phenotype that includes blurred gray-white matter boundaries, heterotopic neurons in the white matter, and increased numbers of subcortical oligodendroglial cells. The epidemiology of MOGI is rare and has been primarily identified in patients with severe drug-resistant epilepsy, especially those of the frontal lobes. Typically, 
patients are children or young adults. And the clinical presentation, patients with MOGI typically present with drug-resistant epilepsy, which may include various seizure types such as atonic, tonic, or focal seizures. Cognitive impairment is also common with a decline in intellectual abilities over time. Now, for the pathology, there is a little bit of repetition, but, you know, repetition is your friend and it's the easiest way to make your monkey brain remember things. So, histologically, Mogi is characterized by blurred grey-white matter boundaries and patchy multifocal increase in the number of subcortical oligodendroglial cells within the white matter. These cells show increased proliferative activity indicated by nuclear K67 labeling compared to focal cortical dysplasia, similar to that seen in DNATs, but far lower than in oligodendroglioma. So I actually find this really interesting, and I'm going to talk about it, but just, you know, disclaimer, I don't really know what I'm talking about here. But sometimes a sentence like that can change the mental model of how you think about a whole bunch of conditions. Early on, as most of us do, we learn that things like focal cortical dysplasia exist and they sound like a real distinct thing. And then you read a little bit more and you realize that, oh, actually, there's a bit of a spectrum running from normal at one end to focal cortical dysplasia at the other, with mild malformations of cortical development somewhere in between, with slightly arbitrary cutoffs at either side. But then you find out that mild malformations of cortical development are more proliferative than focal cortical dysplasia, similar to DNATs, but less than oligodendrogliomas. And don't forget that these entities can coexist with focal cortical dysplasia. And suddenly, now I'm thinking of this sort of area of knowledge, not as just a linear spectrum from one end to another, but more like a 2D plane where these conditions are sort of smeared all over the place where we draw boundaries around certain clusters. Anyway, let's go back to Mogi. Although some heterotopic neurons are present, these are confined in the superficial subcortical white matter and not present more deeply. Importantly, the cortex demonstrates preserved six-layer architecture with no radial microcolons, horizontal dislamination, dysmorphic neurons, or balloon cells, thus not fulfilling criteria for focal cortical dysplasia. Areas of hypomyelination are also present that influence MRI features. And now on to the radiographic features of MOGI. MRI is crucial for the diagnosis of MOGI, although generally similar to focal cortical dysplasia type 2A, which we will come to later, I promise. There are some differences. MOGI typically demonstrates the following features. Blurred grey-white matter boundary and increased flare signal, which is the same as type 2A. Absence of the transmantle sign, which we'll come back to later, but also similar to type 2A. Frontal lobe location and multifocal distribution. And those last two, frontal lobe and multifocal, are really features that are more mogi-like than of uh, focal cortical dysplasia. Additionally, MRI features appear to vary with age, possibly due to changes in myelination, and have been divided into two subtypes. Subtype 1, younger patients less than 5 years of age, lamina subcortical hyperintensities on T2 and flare. And subtype 2, older patients, reduced corticomedullary differentiation and reduced T2 flare subcortical signal. And I find that quite interesting because low T2 flare signal deep to slightly abnormal cortex is definitely something you do see in focal cortical dysplasia in adults. Less common than the high T2 transmantle sign that we'll come back to later, but still a feature to keep an eye out on. Treatment and prognosis. The primary treatment for Mogi is surgical resection of the affected brain tissue. If complete resection is achieved, this generally results in significant improvement in regards to epilepsy. Okay, and now just to finish up, history and etymology, because I find this a little bit entertaining. The acronym MOGI, M-O-G-H-E, was first introduced in 2017, originally for mild malformations of cortical development with oligodendroglial hyperplasia. Subsequent literature attributes the final E 
to an appended and epilepsy. Although in fairness, it's actually difficult to understand how exactly the acronym MOGI was derived in the first place. Yeah, because mild malformations of cortical development with oligodendroglial hyperplasia should not be MOGI, as far as I can tell, but should be MEMECDO. Okay, back to our original focal cortical dysplasia article, finally. And we are up to radiographic features. Here we go. MRI is the modality of choice to assess patients with possible focal cortical dysplasias, although not all histopathological proven areas of focal cortical dysplasia will be evident on MRI, and at other times focal cortical dysplasia will be found adjacent to other lesions. Remember, type 3. General features of focal cortical dysplasia include cortical thickening, Blurring of white matter gray matter junction with abnormal architecture of subcortical layer. T2 flare signal hyperintensity in the white matter with or without the transmantle sign, or sometimes T2 flare signal hypointensity in the adjacent white matter. T2 flare signal hyperintensity of the gray matter, abnormal sulcal or gyral pattern segmental and or lobar hyperplasia or atrophy. And importantly, there's no edema surrounding these lesions. There's no calcification, or at least no macroscopic calcification, and no contrast enhancement. Also, each type of focal cortical dysplasia can exhibit more or less of these features. The types below refer to the ILAE or Bloomkey classification. So type 1, it's generally not obvious on MRI, may seem you may see subtle grey-white matter junction blurring due to neurons located in the subcortical U-fibers, and the majority involve the temporal lobes. So great, you largely can ignore type 1 because you're not going to see them routinely unless you're the sort of freak who attends epilepsy review sessions and spends hours correlating each gyrus with EEG findings. And I have to say, I'm not one of those freaks. Epilepsy imaging, this hunt for subtle blurriness of one gyrus, does not thrill me at all. I get no dopamine rush from doing this. But I'm glad some people do. Anyway, type 2 is where the action is. And it's divided into two subtypes, type 2A and type 2B. And it's important to know these two subtypes because they do correlate with what we see. So type 2A which remember is the one without balloon cells, typically appears as blurring of the gray-white matter junction, cortical thickening, and some abnormal gyral or sulcal pattern in that region. Type 2B is the same as type 2A, but has the addition of, in the vast majority of cases, focal signal abnormalities, increased T2 signal, extending from the cortex to the ventricle, and this is known as the transmantle side, and it's seen in 94% of cases. Okay, so let's do one last detour to find out about the transmantle sign, because this is really critical to a significant portion of the focal cortical displaces that you will identify. The transmantle sign is an MRI feature of focal cortical dysplasia almost exclusively seen in type 2, Bloomkey classification, focal cortical dysplasia, and especially in type 2b. The transmantle sign is believed to be related to abnormal function or injury of the radial glial band fibers, which go on to transform into U. Mm. The transmantle sign is believed to be related to abnormal function of or injury to radial glial fibers, which go on to transform into astrocytes and form the scaffolding over which neurons migrate from the periventricular germinal matrix to the cortex. The presence of hypo or dysmyelination gliosis, neuronal heterotopia, and balloon cells may all contribute to its appearances. And the radiographic features go on to say, although CT is not ideal for the identification of the transmantle sign, it can be visualized as a region of abnormal attenuation, usually increased. This is thought due primarily to the presence of balloon cells, although microcalcifications may also play a role. On MRI, the key feature of transmantle sign is a funnel-shaped high T2 flare signal extending from the cortex down to the ventricle. T1 signal is variable. It can be hypo 
or hyperintense compared to surrounding white matter. Hyperintensity appears to be correlated, again, with the presence of abundant balloon cells and therefore indicative of type 2b, focal cortical dysplasia. So that's important, right? The presence of transmantle sign is already most likely pointing towards type 2b, but particularly if what you see is increased T1 signal of the transmantle region from the cortex to the ventricle, then that even is further indication that there are abundant balloon cells and that therefore it's type 2b, focal cortical dysplasia. Reading on, it is variably associated with other features of focal cortical dysplasia, such as cortical thickening and blurred grey-white matter junction. And the differential diagnosis is worth reading too here, because the main differentials are radial band sign of tuberous sclerosis, which is very similar in appearance on imaging. Cortical tubers are usually multiple. Other stigmata of tuberous sclerosis are usually visible, like subependymal nodules, maybe subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. And it remains unclear whether the radial band sign and transmantle sign are actually the same pathology or distinct entities. And the other differential included here is closed lip schizencephaly, which I guess is really more relevant on CT where that hyperdensity may appear to be gray matter extending from the cortex to the ventricle. Anyway, I found that the fact that maybe we're using two words, radial band sign and transmantle sign to describe the same thing in two different contexts. Interesting. It's not unique at all. Like T2 flare mismatch sign of some IDH mutant astrocytomas and the bright flare rim sign of decemberoplastic neuropathelial tumors or DNATs. Those are essentially the same thing, but because they were described independently and given different names, they Know, exist in a duplicated way in the literature, which unless you kind of spend time trying to understand them rather than just memorizing them, just means that you've got these bits of floating duplicated knowledge. And when you see them, you might end up making the wrong conclusion, especially if you only know one of the two, I guess. Anyway, we're almost done. Let's go back to focal cortical dysplasia because we still have type 3 to cover. Type 3 focal cortical dysplasia, according to the ILAE classification, is focal cortical dysplasia associated with adjacent other abnormalities. Type 3A is hippocampal sclerosis. Type 3B is a tumor like a DNAD or a ganglioglioma. Type 3C is vascular malformation. Type 3D is early childhood insults with resulting gliosis following stroke, for example. And as such, imaging appearances will be dominated by the associated abnormality rather than the dysplasia itself. Okay, we're almost there. Treatment and prognosis. Surgical resection of the refractory epileptogenic area of focal cortical dysplasia typically leads to good seizure control in the presence of transmantle sign better post-surgical outcomes have also been reported. And last but not least, differential diagnosis. And here it adds a whole bunch of stuff, really, which I guess depends on the imaging modality and the specific case. In adults, it's the adult-type diffuse gliomas, such as astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and even glioblastoma, particularly now that you can have molecularly defined glioblastoma where you don't have enhancement and necrosis, because clearly those features are not those of a focal cortical dysplasia. The other differential is of glioneuronal and neuronal tumors, such as ganglioglioma, ganglocytoma, decemberoplastic, neuropathelial tumors. And again, there's some overlap and they can coexist, type 3. And the last one is cortical hematomas of tuberous sclerosis, which are usually more numerous and usually coexist with other features of tuberous sclerosis. So there's not really much to say about that other than clinical presentation is going to be really important for a few of those. If the history is short, the patient is older, the lesion is big, then it's more likely going to be a tumor than focal cortical dysplasia. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. There's a little bit to digest there and I think the best thing to do if you have time is to jump online and have a look at a bunch of examples and cases to really cement this information. And if you like this, hopefully we'll do some more.
And Gaylord's done it again. Well done, Frank. <laughs> My favourite moment in that solo read for, and it sums up the topic of focal cortical dysplasia quite well, actually, was when you said, it's probably a subtle, boring difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know... After you'd spent five minutes describing something. <laughs> some people love epilepsy imaging. Um, I'm, I'm not one of them. If anything, though, when you don't love something, that's all the more important that you're good at doing it because mm. you won't naturally be drawn to it and you need to have right. a process. You'll make mistakes. Yes, because that's that's kind of like my relationship with the epilepsy imaging is it's usually me not spotting anything when I report the mm. MRI and then the MDT occurring and someone coming back and pointing out something to me and asking me to add it into my report. That's like addendum following review at the multidisciplinary <laughs> meeting. A subtle area of T2 hyperintensity is identified, blah, blah, blah. Yes. My primary aim when reading those epilepsy studies is, uh, particularly those where there's not much focus given to a particular area, is to not miss something that I'll be embarrassed about later. Mm. Um, it's hard to see everything. And without really carefully correlating with seizure activity, you not only end up wasting your time because many of these scans don't have an abnormality mm. but you end up overcalling overcalling yeah, little areas that you call mm. false positives and that can really muddy the waters so i think an mdm is the right process for that and each department needs someone who loves to do that sort of painstaking work and i'm very grateful but that person is not me. Thank yeah. you, Elaine, if you're listening. <laughs> Thank you, Beachy, if you're listening. <laughs> um, if you're not having people come to you and go, oh, Andrew, can you have another look at this case and maybe add in this little thing here, then you probably are overcalling your yeah. studies, right? Because they are very subtle findings that do take the correlation with the EEG and things like that. Um, I've written down a couple of little things here that I thought of while listening to that readful mm -hmm. Gaylard. Um, only one of them is directly related to focal <laughs> cortical dysplasia. Um, and that was the point that these should be something you think about in the setting of longstanding seizure. Mm -hmm. But in the setting of, you know, first seizure or new onset seizures, you'd be thinking more along the lines of, of a tumour. I'd never really thought about that before. You know, it helps kind of frame your approach to the MRI interpretation and if you do see something framing the probabilities for what it might be yeah i mean people with focal cortical dysplasias have to have a first seizure at some point mm. and that's not always you know when they're an infant but usually particularly if you have an adult practice or where the patient is an adult there usually will be a long history mm. and so much of what radiology should be is about integrating everything you know about the patient into some sort of pre and post test probability of a given diagnosis. And just looking at images in isolation, I think you end up making some pretty silly mistakes. And, and this is an example where sometimes focal cortical dysplasia can look very similar to a tumor, but thinking about the context will help you get it right more often than not. Mm. I've also written here the International League Against Epilepsy yes, <laughs> um, because it reminded me of a movie that I watched the other day. Not that it's the same title, but it has a similar kind of vibe to it. It's a mm -hmm. Netflix one. It's called The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Have uh, you seen that one? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a Guy Ritchie film. It's got Henry Cavill and Alan, Alan Richardson. So he's the actual actor who plays Jack Reacher, not Tom Cruise. Tom right. Cruise. Remember Tom Cruise made some He made Reacher a movie, films. right? Or a couple. Yeah, yeah. He made the movie and he looks nothing like Jack Reacher should look like, right? Because right. he's tiny. Jack Reacher's got to be built like a, as my father-in-law would say, a, a brick shit house. But Alan Richardson is that kind of person. Is anyway, Alan Richardson the guy who plays the Swede? The Swedish guy, right. yeah. Oh, he's massive. Yeah. Yeah. He's massive. Yeah. Absolutely. Ma and also plays a character in this one totally different to his character in the Reacher series, right? He's yeah. much more kind of camp and happy in this in this movie. Um, yeah, anyway, it's quite quirky, would you agree, this whole thing? And apparently it's very, very loosely based on a true story, that kind of top secret mission in World War II, which was, was it called? Operation Postmaster, I think. Yeah, I did actually see it. Uh, and just until right now, I didn't realise that the main character was Henry Cavill. Mm. Um, yeah, he was, he was hard to recognise as well. And he was great. There's well, a bit of comedy see, in there. I thought he was really underwhelming. So right. much so that I remember while I was watching it, thinking, 
they keep telling me that they've recruited him because he's the only person charismatic enough to have all these people follow him <laughs> into this impossible. And I was like, he's like a wet sock, not wolfish, not wolfish, <laughs> just really uninspiring. You didn't like the fact that he kept going, I got to get me that coat. And then, he'd, <laughs> and then he'd turn up in the coat. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I enjoyed it. And I have to preface that by saying that I watched it while running on a treadmill. So, you Perfect. know, my opinions don't necessarily match what I would have said had I watched it at the cinema or No, but it's that, it's that kind of, it's an entertaining film you might watch at home, not necessarily. It was, it was entertaining. Cinema, right? Yeah. All right. And the final thing I have written here, Gaylord, is uh, buzzwords in radiology. Because uh, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not sure we've spoken about buzzwords specifically before. You mentioned the T2 flare mismatch in, you know, IDH mutant gliomas as being the same thing that we describe as bright rim sign in DNets. And it reminds me of how we often use buzzwords for appearances that imply a certain pathology, but you only use them if you're pretty certain that that is the thing, which is weird, yeah. right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like back to, back to front. Yeah. You know, you can only use this term if you definitely know it's going to be this pathology. Otherwise, you have to use some other term. Some vaguer descriptive term. Yeah, yeah, like if you see incomplete enhancement around a lesion and you think it's demyelination, then you can say open ring sign. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, if you don't think it's demyelination, then you're not allowed to use that term. You just say, oh, the, uh, the enhancement uh, is incomplete. Try and avoid using yeah. the term open ring sign. It's, it's weird. Yeah, and you said that it was backwards, but it's not just just backwards it's sort of harmful as well because Mm. I'm fairly certain that your dumb monkey brain is sitting there listening to what your dumb monkey mouth is saying or typing. And so as soon as you put out one of these buzzwords, you kind of double down on that and Mm. you start thinking that that diagnosis is much more certain than it probably would be otherwise. And I think with labels in general, but particularly these signs, they're substitutes for for late for understanding. They become sort of their own little placeholder. There's a clip from an interview with Richard Feynman, the, the physicist, that I keep thinking about. And I'll try and find it uh, it's on YouTube, so I'll find it and put it in the show notes. But mm-hmm. from memory, he's talking about the influence his father had on him when he was a kid. And he talks about how his father was walking with him through the forest and he says, do you see, son, that bird, that's a blue-breasted robin or something. And how knowing that it's a blue-breasted robin doesn't teach you anything about the bird, that it's a label that Mm. allows you to talk to other people about what you've seen. But you shouldn't confuse that with knowing something about the bird. And I think with radiology, we use so many descriptors and names of signs that are just empty labels that we apply to them. And if you don't step back and think, in the case of uh, T2 flare mismatch or bright rim sign, it's like, well, what's going on? Why do we call it? What does that tell us about the tumour? If you just use these labels, you end up just stamp collecting rather than yeah. understanding what you can work out about the tumour. It's, it's almost like a, a cognitive bias in it when you when mm. you start throwing. And I think it comes about in, in Australia in particular, it came about through the format of our oral exams because I think candidates were actually taught to, if there's a buzzword, throw it in because yeah. you're essentially communicating to the examiner very quickly that you know what this is and you're yeah. playing the game. You're like, oh, there's pencil and cup deformity and there's acroosteolysis and they're like, oh, he knows that this patient has psoriatic arthritis yeah. and then, you know, you're ticking it off. Yeah. Whereas if you describe it without using some of those buzzwords, the examiner's kind of like, does he know? I don't think he knows. He hasn't said he hasn't said pencil and cup yet. He doesn't know. Oh, no. he yeah, doesn't. And if you do point. say, yeah. if you do say psoriatic at the end, they're like, oh, he only just got there. Yeah, and often if you use those buzzwords, the case would come down sooner because exactly they lean forward and, and start to cases. in our day yeah. start to pull down the film because as soon yeah. as you say pencil and cup, they're like, oh, yep, he knows what this is. So yeah. there is that. I think it almost got trained into us to apply these buzzwords, but I think when you're actually looking at a case, you want to stay open. Don't commit yourself to well, and a named sign if you if it's not there. Just describe it. And for God's sake, don't don't use them in your reports. Yeah. With, with only a few exceptions, maybe. But whenever I see a report that says, you know, racing car ventricles, it's so <laughs> cringeworthy. <laughs> uh, that's all I had written down on my little list here, 
Gala. So I think it might be time to wrap up this episode. Uh, before we do, can I ask our dear listeners to take two minutes to complete our yearly census? You can do that just by going to bit.ly or bit.ly slash r dash census 2024. I'll put the just link. Just by simply in writing in lots of random letters and numbers. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll put a link. In the, but or please just do. visiting the website and clicking the banners that yeah, should be out there or for do a that. week or so. But please yeah. do because um, the data we get from it is actually interesting and does shape decisions that we make. And maybe we should actually in a future episode uh, talk about some of what comes out of the census, Dixon. The results. Yeah, it could be interesting for mm. us at least. Might not be for the listeners, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> worth a go. <laughs> um, I'll have to read this next line. And and how else can people get in contact with us, Gaylord? Well, we're at Radiopedia on X and Instagram, and you can email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and or feedback. Yeah, I've officially deleted X and Twitter from my phone, Gaylord, and I know you've done that a long time yeah. ago. So I think we should just change this going forward to to the email um, podcast at radiopedia.org. LinkedIn, I've had quite a few people reach out on LinkedIn um, with messages about the podcast. So very happy for you to contact me there. But then there's also the Radiopedia community, which is another great place to, to get in contact with us. That's probably the best place for me anyway. Um, you just go straight to radiopedia.org slash chat and use your that, normal Radiopedia account URL. details. <laughs> What's that? I said that's a that's an easier URL. To that's remember. a much easier URL. Just use your normal account details, and uh, all the editors and lots of community members hang out there. I'm logged in there all the time, pretty much. So that's uh, a great place to reach out. And if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all access pass to our online courses and conference. Radiopedia 2025 is only 11.5 months away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in doing so, you'll be helping us to give free conference access to people in 125 low and middle income countries. And and what else can people do to help us out, Gaylard? And you can also help us out by leaving a five star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Yes, you can definitely still do that. Mm. Don't ignore that one. That's no. a good one to keep in the outro. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll catch you all again sometime soon uh, in four weeks because we'll be switching to monthly uh, in the reading room. Stay right, everyone. See you in a month, a whole month. Oh, so many things will have changed. I know. You will have stepped down from so many more things. <laughs> <laughs> we're retired. Right. Hey, we're, we're actually uh, meeting for lunch. We are. We it's go. a really nice day outside. The, the place you suggested is not facing the right direction for the sun. We'll so go somewhere maybe else we, then. Yeah, go somewhere sunny, I reckon. All right. But anyway, listeners don't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.